Well, good morning, brothers and sisters. Thank you for welcoming us back here once again. So please turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Now here at Oasis you have a particular vision where you like to focus on the words spoken by Jesus. This is um, something that you enjoy here at Oasis. Now something you should know, however, is that the words of Jesus are not limited to Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Of course the entire Bible is Holy Spirit inspired. All scripture is inspired by, uh, by God. However, the words spoken by Jesus himself are not limited to Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And if you have Bibles where the words of Jesus are in red letters, the red letter Bibles, you will find that the words in Revelation 2 and 3 are also in red letters as well. You will find that they are red letters, therefore words spoken by Jesus Christ himself. So in Revelation, sorry, it's, um, Revelation chapter 3, and what you'll find here is that Jesus uh, has inspired the uh, Apostle John to write seven letters to seven churches, seven different churches. Now these are seven literal churches that existed in the first century in the area of Asia Minor, which is today known as Turkey. It's the same area, Asia Minor. Seven churches in the first century which existed in Asia Minor. However, these have a particular meaning in that when you see these seven churches in the order that they're in, they do correspond to seven different stages throughout the last 2,000 years of church history. And again, you might think, well, how, how, you know, how can you prove that? Well, the thing is, it proves itself simply by studying church history and studying these seven letters. There are literally hundreds of parallels you can draw between how these churches were and the church age that it corresponds to throughout the last 2,000 years. Again, you can break up the last 2,000 years into seven different stages of church history, and it all fits perfectly. You don't have to force it to fit. You don't have to twist anything or distort anything. It just fits itself. It corresponds to seven different ages throughout the last 2,000 years of church history. And again, there's a number of examples you can give on this. However, here we're going to focus on what is the last letter, to the church of Laodicea. Now, of course, the church of Laodicea, that corresponds to the church age today, the modern church age, the present day. So in Revelation chapter 3, from verse 14, this is the letter to the Laodicean church. Now, again, it doesn't negate the literal meaning in that John here is writing to a church that existed in the first century. But as I said, the character of this church corresponds to the church as it is in the last days today, the present day. And again, there's a number of parallels you can draw between each of these churches and the different uh, seven stages of church history that we see. So we'll just read through this, this entire letter to the Laodiceans, and then we'll go through it bit by bit. From Revelation 3.14, it says, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot, so then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit on, with me on my throne, as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So again, this is a letter to a literal church, the Laodicean church, which existed in the first century. But as I said, it does correspond to the church age that we're in today. Now these seven different churches, they all have names of course, and the first thing that we see about the character of each church is in the name, the meaning of the name. Now the name Laodicea, in Greek it's Laodikei, and what that literally means is people's 
opinions or people's verdicts. Laos is people and Dikei is verdict or opinion. So Laodicea literally means people's opinions. Remember, the character of the church is often reflected in its name. We see this with the other six churches as well. So the last day's church, the church of the present day, the literal meaning in the Greek is people's opinions. And of course, that fits perfectly in that it's a trend that we see quite a lot in the church today, isn't it? We have the authority of the word of God. We have the Holy Spirit inspired scripture to go by. And yet not every church can say that that is what they live by. Why? Because it often doesn't fit with their vision or agenda. So what do they have to do? They have to ignore certain parts of scripture. They have to basically go by their own opinions and their own feelings instead of upholding what God has already written down in his word. It's a trend that we see an awful lot today with some Christians whose doctrines and beliefs and agendas are not based on scripture anymore. They're based on their own emotions and their own feelings and their own opinions. So in other words, when they see things in the word of God that doesn't line up with their feelings and opinions, they ignore it. We've, had, we've heard this from certain Christians before who have said, I, I just ignore those parts of the Bible. They actually admit that they don't go by the entire Bible. They say that not all of the Bible is the word of God. Have you ever heard a Christian say that to you? A so-called Christian say that you can't trust the whole Bible, not the entire Bible is the word of God. You know, they'll believe the parts they like. Oh yeah, that's fine. That's, that, that's the word of God. But when it comes to the bits that make them feel uncomfortable, that's when they say, oh, well, that's not the word of God that is. We hear that quite a lot these days. It's not something you'd have had several hundred years ago. It's something that we see today in these last days, in the present day church, the church of Laodicea, people's opinions. What they're really saying is, is that if I was God, this is what I would do. That's really what they're saying. That's really what they mean deep down. If I was God, this is what I would be like, and this is how I would do things. That's really what they mean deep down when they reject the authority of the word of God. Now, of course, there's multiple warnings in scripture about this in revelation 22 it says from verse 18 for i testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book if anyone adds to these things god will add him to the plagues that are written in this book and if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy god shall take away his part from the book of life and from the holy city and from the things which are written in this book that's pretty much the last verse of the bible and we have that warning there at the very end of our Bibles to not add to or take away from the word of God. What are people doing? It's exactly that. They're taking away and adding to from the word of God. First Timothy verse, uh, chapter 6 and verse 3 says, If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching which accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. So it's not... The Bible they disagree with, it's Jesus they disagree with, it's God they disagree with, because God is the author of this word. This word is, is Holy Spirit inspired from cover to cover. So when people have a problem with anything in scripture, it's not us they disagree with, it's not the Bible itself they disagree with, it's Jesus they disagree with, it's him who they should take it up with, isn't it? So that's the first character and trait that we see about this church again it doesn't negate the literal meaning that this was a literal church that existed in the first century but it corresponds to the present church age that we're in today people's opinions is the meaning of the name laodicea now from verse 15 it said i know your works that you are neither cold nor hot i wish you were cold or hot so then because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Lukewarm is a mixture of hot and cold, isn't it? And if you have a mixture of hot and cold water in your mouth, you can't spit out the cold water and leave the hot water behind, can you? You have to get rid of the lot. That's what Jesus is saying here. You're lukewarm. I can't get rid of just the cold without getting rid of the hot. The whole lot has to go. I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. And of course, it's another trait that we see in the church in the present age. It is filled with lukewarm believers, lukewarm Christians, people who call themselves Christians, people who profess to be born again, people who profess to love Jesus, but actually live no different to the rest of the world. It's something we see quite a lot today in the church in the present age, that people live no different to the rest of the world, still professing faith in Christ. 
James chapter 4 verse 4 says, whoever is a friend of the world is an enemy of God. That's quite a verse. Whoever is a friend of the world is an enemy of God. So when you see these so-called Christians who are living in the world, again, the Bible says we are in the world but not of it. We are in the world but not of it. When you see these Christians who are of the world, who are living exactly the same as someone who is not born again, the Bible says they're not just a friend of the world, but they're an enemy of God. And we see quite a lot of this with some so-called Christians who are lukewarm. Again, the definition lukewarm can be quite varied. You can say that someone who believes things based on their own opinions instead of on the word of God is a lukewarm Christian. Someone who lives a carnal life of sin is a lukewarm Christian. Anyone who doesn't abide by the teachings of the Bible is a lukewarm Christian. And again, it's something that was a problem in the Laodicean church. It's something Jesus is rebuking here. And it's a problem that we see in the church today, is that it is filled with lukewarm Christians. Again, it's a mixture. It's a mixture of hot and cold. And there's many verses in the Bible that tells us that God does not like mixtures. God does not like mixtures. He likes purity. He likes things to be pure. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 21. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot eat from the Lord tables, sorry, the table of the Lord and the table of demons. So it's quite appropriate that today we've had communion, we've come to the Lord's table. But the Bible says you can't then go to the table of demons. You can't then drink from the cup of demons. And there's some Christians in the church today who like to do both. They like to have their feet in both camps. And I think the reason that we have so many lukewarm Christians is because we have lukewarm preachers. Lukewarm preachers produces lukewarm Christians, doesn't it? Amen. So that's really the second trait that we see. We see that the church of Laodicea was a church based on its own opinions, just as it is today. And it was filled with Christians who were lukewarm. In other words, they were probably false Christians. They weren't born again. They weren't regenerate. And it's what we see today. Many so-called Christians who profess faith in Christ but aren't actually born again. Now in verse 17, it says, Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. The thing you have to understand about the historical city of Laodicea is that it was a very wealthy city. Laodicea was a very wealthy city where people put their trust in their wealth and their money. Same sort of thing we see today. A lot of people put their trust in their wealth and in their money, and they think because of that, they have need of nothing. Jesus says here, you think you have need of nothing, but you don't know that you're actually wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And it's what the church is like today, isn't it? The church today is very money-orientated. You've only got to go to America and see some of these prosperity ministries, and it's all about money. You don't hear about repentance, you don't hear about sin, you don't hear about judgment, you don't even hear about the forgiveness of God's grace anymore. All you hear about is money, how God wants to bless you, how God wants to make you rich, God wants to prosper you. Now there's nothing wrong with prosperity, God doesn't want us to be poor. That's, that's one of the curses that came as a result of sin, was poverty. However, that's not what the gospel is. The gospel has now become prosperity. If you become a Christian, God's going to bless you and God's going to make you rich. Well, when people actually want to become Christians and that doesn't happen, what's going to happen? What's going to, what's going to happen? They're going to fall away, aren't they? They're going to fall away because they haven't got what they were told they're going to get. In other words, they've been missold the gospel. The gospel is that we are all sinners and we are all deserving of judgment, but God sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to take our sin upon himself, and he rose from the dead on the third day, and now whoever repents and believes in him will be forgiven and have everlasting life. That's the gospel, isn't it? The gospel in a very, very brief summary. But that gospel seems to have gone out the window now because now it's all about money. It's all about prosperity. Again, you go to some of these mega churches in America, they are packed full of people. They are absolutely full with thousands of people. Why? Because it's what they want to hear, isn't it? People go to these churches because it's what they want to hear. They don't want to be told that they've got to repent of this or that. They don't want to be told that their sin is separating them from God. They want to be told that God's going to bless them and make them rich. That's what they want to hear, isn't it? Well, 2 Timothy 4 warns us about that in verse 3. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. 
The reason these prosperity churches are packed is because it's what they want to hear. They have itching ears and they want to be comforted. They want to be told that God is going to bless them and God is going to make them rich. Now, of course, God does want to bless us. We're not negating that God wants to bless us and God does want to prosper us. But that comes as a result of salvation. That is not the gospel. The gospel is, as I said, that Jesus died for our sins and whoever repents and believes in him will be born again and have everlasting life. Then the blessings come as part of that package. The blessings and the healing and things like this, it all comes as part of the salvation package. You receive it by faith just as you did your salvation. But as I said, today is very different. Today, the gospel has become about money and prosperity. A big problem in the Laodicean church in the first century. They were all very, very wealthy and put their trust in their wealth and their money. But they didn't know, as Jesus said, that they were wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. You can have all the money in the world and all the wealth in the world. But if you don't have Christ, you're bankrupt. You're spiritually bankrupt if you don't have Christ. And on the other side, you can be absolutely skint. You can absolutely be brassic. But if you have Christ in your life, you're the richest person in the world, aren't you? You cannot have a penny to your name, but as long as you have Christ, you are rich. Hallelujah. So again, three main traits there of the Laodicean church. People's opinions, lukewarm Christians, and money, wealth. This is what the Laodicean church was like, and guess what? It's exactly what the church is like today, isn't it? However... This is how the pattern of these letters go. If you read the other six letters, they all kind of have the same pattern and the same format. What then Jesus gives is the exhortation or the appeal or the warning even. So in verse 18, he says, I counsel you to buy me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich. In other words, the gold that you have now is worthless. That's going to perish. Your money is going to perish with you. But the gold that Jesus can give us is refined in the fire. And gold, of course, has to do with heavenly things, isn't it? We see this in Revelation 22. Gold is typological of heaven. So he's saying, the gold you have now is worthless. Get the gold from me. And white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. So a wealthy city like Laodicea, they'd have all been walking around in very expensive garments. They'd have had very flash clothing. Again, no different to today. And what he's saying is that those garments, that clothing, again, it's going to perish. It's worthless. It may be expensive. It may cost you a lot of money, but it's worthless. It is going to perish with you. You should have the white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. What's the garments that Jesus offers us? So Isaiah 61 verse 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation and has covered me with the robe of righteousness. That's the garments that Jesus can offer you, the robe of righteousness. In other words, the Laodiceans were walking around in their own righteousness. They were walking around in their own righteousness. And what does the Bible say about our own righteousness? Filthy rags, Isaiah 64. Our own righteousness is like filthy rags. The righteousness that you need is the righteousness of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. If you are walking around in your own righteousness, the Bible, not me, the Bible says it is like filthy rags. And again, these Laodiceans, these wealthy Laodiceans were walking around in very expensive clothing, very flash clothing, and Jesus is saying that it's worthless, it's going to perish. The white garments, again, white in the Bible has to do with purity as well. God loves purity, doesn't he? He loves pure things. And white is typological of purity. Whenever you see the high priest dressed in a white garment on the Day of Atonement, once a year, that was to signify the purity. So Jesus offers us white garments, the garments of salvation and the robe of righteousness. Revelation sixteen fifteen. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments on, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. What were the robe of righteousness for? It's to cover the shame of our nakedness, isn't it? Nakedness has to do with sin, doesn't it? Because when Adam and Eve sinned against God, they were ashamed because of their nakedness and they hid, didn't they? What did they try to do? They tried to cover up their nakedness with fig leaves. And but God said, no, that's not good enough. You need the sacrifice. So he gave them animal skins instead. That's the first sacrifice that you see in the Bible. That was the sacrifice that covered the shame of their nakedness, not the fig leaves. There's a whole bunch of things you can go into about that. 
But the only thing that can cover your sin is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to say, anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. Now something else you need to know about the city of Laodicea in the first century is that it was famous for the medical school of Laodicea. And it was very famous for curing eye diseases. When you had eye diseases in the first century, the medical school of Laodicea was famous for curing them. And they used to make this eye ointment out of uh, this powder that came from Phrygian stones, very rare Phrygian stones. They had this powder which they used to make this eye ointment out of, eye ointment which would cure any eye disease. And again, what Jesus is doing here is he's saying things that they can relate to. He's saying things that they would know about. So he's talking about their expensive garments, their money, their wealth. But he's also saying here, you need eye salve so that you can see. In other words, the thing that Laodicea was famous for, producing this eye ointment which could cure eye diseases, that's worthless as well because you can cure all the eye diseases in the world, but if you're still going to hell, it means nothing. What you need is the eye salve, which of course is the Holy Spirit. There are a couple of types of Holy Spirit that you see in the Bible, water being one of the main ones. Whenever you see water or rain, it represents the Holy Spirit, doesn't it? Oil is another one, oil. Or give me oil in my lamp. You know, the, the wise and foolish virgins, they didn't have oil in their lamps, did they? So oil is another type of Holy Spirit that you see. Whenever you see water or oil, it is representative of the Holy Spirit. There's one more here in Revelation 3, and that's the eye salve. It's the only time you see it in the Bible. It's eye salve, eye ointment. And what it does is it doesn't just cure your physical eye disease. It cures your spiritual blindness. And this is what I spoke about a few months ago here when I spoke about uh, John chapter 9 when Jesus healed the blind man. Whenever you see someone being healed of blindness in the Bible, it represents us being healed of our spiritual blindness. Again, before we knew Christ, before we were born again, we were blind. We were blind to our sin and we needed the Holy Spirit to open our eyes. Every single one of you who's born again today, the reason you are born again is because the Holy Spirit opened your eyes to the truth. Before that, you can't see it. You can't see the truth. If someone's blindfolded and you tell them to walk from here to the other end of town or to the beach, they have no idea where they're going. They can have all the doctorates and PhDs in the world. If they're blindfolded, they can't get to the beach. What needs to happen? The blindfold needs to come off. Well, that's exactly what Jesus does when he heals us of our blindness. He literally takes a blindfold off our eyes. Now you can see. Now you know where you're going. Well, that's what the eye salve is for. And again, the reason he's using this analogy of the eye salve, the eye ointment, is because it's something they'd have related to. Laodicea was famous for this medical school who produced this eye ointment made out of this powder. So they'd have known about this, and that's why Jesus is talking to them here on their own level. The eye ointment that your city is famous for producing is worthless. It can cure any eye disease in the world, but it can't cure spiritual blindness. Who's the only one who can cure spiritual blindness? Jesus is. The Holy Spirit is the only one who can lift that blindness of our eyes. And that's what he's saying here. He's saying, don't worry about that eye ointment that your city's famous for. You need the eye salve from me. I'm the one who can open up your eyes. I'm the one who can open up your eyes to the truth. And that's what everybody needs. Everyone needs to have their eyes opened to the truth. When someone is an unbeliever and they're really hard in that position, it is because they are blind. It's because they need their eyes opened. Again, there's a whole bunch of things you can talk about when it comes to spiritual blindness. So again, being able to see physically means nothing if you can't see spiritually. And again, if you've got poor eyesight, I know it's quite common for people's eyesight to start going in their old age. But if you've got poor eyesight, if you can see spiritually, don't worry about the physical eyesight. It means nothing. If you can see spiritually, that's all that matters. And there's people out there who have really good eyesight, 20-20 vision, but are blind spiritually. And that's what Jesus is getting at here in this letter, is that you need the eye salve to cure your spiritual blindness. And again, whenever you see people being healed of blindness, the blind beggar in John 9, Paul in Acts chapter 9 as well, it's always a picture of us seeing spiritually, finally. I was blind, but now I see. Remember that? I was blind, but now I see. Hallelujah. <laughs> And then in verse 19, he says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Now, of course, that's kind of in line with Proverbs 3 and Hebrews 12. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. The reason that God 
rebukes and chastens and disciplines us is because he loves us. He only disciplines those who he loves. Again, this is all from Hebrews 12. He only disciplines those who are his. A father doesn't discipline someone else's child. He disciplines his own. He won't discipline someone else's children. He disciplines his own children. So when God disciplines us, according to Hebrews 12, it's because he's treating us as his children. And yet if you go without discipline, if you're left to your own devices without discipline, it says you are an illegitimate child. You are not one of his. Again, because a father doesn't discipline someone else's kids. God will not discipline Satan's children. He'll discipline his children. So when you are disciplined by the Lord, it's because he's treating you as his own. Count it as a blessing. It may not seem like a blessing at the time. I've certainly had God discipline. I'm not just speaking from scripture. I'm speaking from personal experience as well. It's not nice. However, God does it for our own good. Why? Because we are his. Because he loves us. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. He does that to those who are his, not anyone else's. It also tells us that in the church of Laodicea, historically and also in the present age, there are people who are his. There are people stuck in these lukewarm churches who are his, who are born again. Same as in the church of Laodicea. It was a lukewarm church based on opinions and money. But there were people in this church who were genuinely born again believers. And God says, these are the ones who I love and rebuke and chasten. And it's the same today. There are many people in these lukewarm churches who are getting fed, who are dying of spiritual starvation. That doesn't mean to say that they're not God's own children. There are some who are born again, who genuinely belong to him. And now what he does is he begins to appeal to the individuals. And I think that's the same as well today, is that... God isn't really appealing to these churches anymore because they're so far gone, they're so far backslidden. We see it a lot in the mainstream denominations particularly. They're so far backslidden that God is not appealing to the churches anymore. He's appealing to the individuals. He's appealing to the individuals in these churches. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and him with me. Of course, dining and eating together in Hebrew thought, that has to do with fellowship. It's very... uh, Hebrew to actually have food in fellowship and that's why we have communion we fellowship together as part of our fellowship isn't it having communion together so this is why Jesus was rebuked strongly by the Pharisees for eating with sinners and tax collectors and prostitutes it's because he was eating with them in Hebrew thought when you eat with someone you become one with them you fellowship with them this is why Jesus again was rebuked by the Pharisees for eating with sinners and prostitutes and tax collectors So he says, whoever hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and him with me. So again, it's to do with fellowship. But think about it. If Jesus is knocking on the door, again, he's talking about the church here, Laodicea. If he's knocking on the door, where is he? He's on the outside. He's on the outside of the church if he's knocking on the door. If you're on the inside knocking on the door, it doesn't make sense, does it? So if you're on the outside knocking on the door... It's because Jesus has been removed from the church. And I think that's the case today as well. Now, you can go to a lot of these churches and not hear one verse of scripture being taught. They're teaching you other things like yoga or Harry Potter or something like this. You can go into these churches now and you won't hear one verse of scripture being taught. Again, because it's not based on scripture anymore. Churches' doctrines are not based on scripture anymore. It's based on their own opinions. What does Laodicea mean? People's opinions. This is what you get now in a lot of these mainstream churches. Of course, there are some very good ones left, of course. But a lot of the mainstream churches now are not teaching the word of God anymore. Jesus is the word, isn't he? The word who became flesh and dwelt among us. Churches who reject the Bible reject Jesus Christ himself. That is why Jesus is on the outside knocking on the door. Because he's not in the church anymore. He's been taken out of the church. Because people do not base their, or churches do not base their doctrines on the word of God anymore. It's all based on their own opinions. It's all based on what they want to hear, isn't it? This is why people, you know, they want to hear this stuff. They want to hear the comforting stuff. Jesus has been taken out of the church and he's knocking on the door. Appealing now to the individuals again. He's no longer appealing to the church anymore. He's appealing to the faithful individuals. And that's why it says... To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit on my, with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So him who overcomes, again, this is how each of these epistles works. If you read the other six, it always ends with a promise of blessing to the ones who overcome. 
To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So what that means is when Jesus returns, he's returning to reign on David's throne. And it means you and I are also going to reign with him as kings and priests. The kingdom of God is Christ reigning as supreme king with us reigning with him. The saints, that is. It's only for the saints. It's not for those who are not born again. Verse 22, he who has an ear, let him hear. Again, it's those individuals he's appealing to. He who has an ear, let him hear. So the church of Laodicea in the first century had turned its back on the word of God at this point. There were still some faithful individuals left in it. But the church itself in general had turned its back on the word of God. And it's the same today. The mainstream church has departed from the word of God. The word of God has pretty much gone out the window now. And it's now the individuals who God is appealing to. And what's going to happen to the church of Laodicea? Well, Jesus has told us already. I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Why? Because you can't get rid of the cold without getting rid of the hot. Hot and cold mixes makes lukewarm. And you've got to get rid of the whole thing. And you can see that already a lot of these lukewarm churches are already failing. And I think what's happened in the last three years has kind of accelerated this as well. What we're seeing now are mainstream churches declining. And it's because... Jesus is already in the process of vomiting them out of his mouth. He's getting rid of some of these lukewarm churches. In Matthew 5, he said, you are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. The salt of the earth. We think now the salt of the earth is like an expression, isn't it? Oh, he's the salt of the earth, that guy. You know, what it means biblically is preserving. You know, the, the expression that we hear today, it means that you're honest and hardworking, you know, salt of the earth. But biblically, it means to preserve. The salt of the earth is to preserve the word of God. And the church has stopped doing that now. But the thing is, what Jesus said then was when the salt stops doing its job, when the salt loses the saltiness, you can't do anything with it. You have to get rid of it. You have to throw it away. It's good for nothing. You can't make it salty again. You can't renew it. You have to get rid of it to be trampled underfoot. And that's what's happening now. These churches who are no longer fit for purpose, God's getting rid of them. He's doing away with them. How many church buildings are closing now? There are church buildings everywhere that are empty, closed, because God's done away with them. Because the salt has stopped doing its job. When the salt stops doing its job, upholding the word of God, that is. That is what the salt is there to do. is there to preserve and uphold the word of God. And what did Jesus say? You are the salt of the earth. Well, the saints, some of the saints have stopped doing that now. The churches have stopped doing that. They've stopped upholding the, the authority of the word of God. Church is now blessing that, that God does not bless. And that's why God is doing away with them. I will vomit you out of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear. Again, there are faithful individuals in the lukewarm church. And what Jesus is saying is, come out of her, my people. Isn't it? Revelation 18. Come out of her, my people. Because they are his people. And that's why he's calling these people to come out. And the lukewarm church, unfortunately, has no future. Again, it's the literal meaning of the first century church, which was Laodicea, but also corresponds to how the church age is now. Exactly how the church of Laodicea was is exactly how the church is today in these last days. And we have to persevere in the truth, we have to persevere on the narrow way, and we have to continue upholding the authority of Scripture. That is what saints are called to do. We are called to uphold the authority of God's Word. Let's keep doing that, brothers and sisters, and let's pray and thank the Lord for the strength He's given us and His Word. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much, Lord, for this day. We thank you for this gathering, and we thank you for this warning in your word about how the church looks like in these last days and just we thank you lord that your word is just true and that there's no error in it and that we don't even have to you know force these things to fit they just fit perfectly lord and we can see just how the church of laodicea was is exactly how the church is in these last days and lord we thank you that you still call out a faithful remnant you always have your faithful seven thousand who have never bowed the knee to bow And we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you that there are faithful individuals who love you and who uphold your word. Help us to be like that, Lord. Help us to continue standing upon the authority of the word of God, the only true word. But above all, Lord, we thank you for he himself who is the word. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And we thank you that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. As we approach the holiday season, let us remember, Lord, 
that that word became flesh and set up his tabernacle among us, Lord, and that he will return to tabernacle among us once again. We thank you for Jesus Christ, our Saviour, and we thank you for the Holy Spirit who lifts our blindness and makes us see the truth that we might embrace it. We thank you, Lord, again for this word, and we thank you for your dear Son, Jesus Christ, who bled and died for us and rose from the dead on the third day. We thank you and praise you in his mighty name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah.